Packing for a European trip may seem like a simple matter until you dig a bit deeper. And serious packing mistakes can mean the difference between a very good time and a not so good time abroad. In this video, I will show you what to pack for Europe. I'll share some Europe travel hacks and mistakes. And I'm also gonna let you in on a little packing list experiment that I'm doing for my upcoming three month carry on trip through Europe. I have no idea how this experiment is going to go, but I'm pretty excited about it. Plus at the end, I will share three tips that could make or break your European trip. Let's do this. The first Europe packing mistake is packing a big heavy bag. The challenge for Europe in particular is that usually when people visit Europe, they move around a bit. And Europe is a fantastic area of the world to explore overland by train or bus. But between the cobblestone streets and the train stations, which often involves some steep steps to get on and off the trains or buses, plus hauling around heavy luggage, it's no fun. So I suggest traveling with carry-on sized luggage if you can manage it, which leads me to mistake number two, which is not checking the airline requirements for carry-on baggage. I have a few popular episodes about avoiding carry-on baggage fees and what to pack in a carry-on suitcase and another one about the bag that I specifically bring on board as my personal item. And in the comments of these videos, there was a lot of criticism about what I pack not being allowable in Europe despite the fact that I've traveled all over Europe with this stuff. So here's the deal. You have to check the airline requirements for bags. In some cases, especially on budget airlines, the bare bones basic fare often has very low baggage weight or size limitations. But if you pay a little bit extra, you can usually upgrade the baggage allowance to normal international size and weight standards. I don't stress about the extra fee. I just consider it a part of the cost of the airfare, which is usually pretty cheap to begin with on these budget airlines. By contrast, when you fly with a major airline, carry-on bags are usually included in the cost of airfare, which is in turn way more expensive. So you're paying for it either way. But if all else fails and the absolute maximum carry-on luggage weight or size is smaller than what I have, then I just check my carry-on luggage. European packing mistake number three is bringing a voltage converter. They're kind of big, they're kind of heavy, and they're probably unnecessary. Europe has different outlets that run on 240 volts. North America, by contrast, runs on 110 volts. The problem is if you plug something made for 110 volts into a higher voltage outlet, the motor will immediately burn out. A hairdryer is a classic example of something that people try to bring abroad from North America and they get destroyed. However, as long as you are not bringing something like a hairdryer, most electronics are capable of dealing with both voltages. The trick is to look at the power adapter for whatever it is that you have. If you see 100 to 240 V, then you'll likely be fine. The only thing that you'll need then is a plug adapter as opposed to a voltage converter. This is the smallest travel ad plug adapter that I found and it has the ability to plug into any outlet anywhere in the world. I'll link to it in the description. The trick is it does not convert the voltage, only the plug. As for bringing hair dryers, more often than not, you'll find one at your accommodation. If not, you could buy a cheap one when you arrive just for your time in Europe, or you could bring a dual voltage hair dryer with you. But remember, it will take up valuable packing space and wait. Mistake number four is bringing too many toiletries. Chances are you can find the stuff that you need in Europe if you run out of anything. And personally, I love discovering new products this way. Over the years, I found some really interesting toiletries abroad. But for some toiletries that I highly recommend you bring from home, check out my episode about solid toiletries to learn more about how they are my carry-on secret weapon. Speaking of solid toiletries, let me tell you about Kitsch, who is sponsoring this video and who has significantly enhanced my hair care routine at home and abroad. I'm using a bunch of different stuff from Kitsch, but today I'm talking about their shampoo and conditioner bars. Not only do they last way longer than liquid shampoo and they take up a fraction of the space, but you also don't have to worry about liquid mishaps in your luggage. And of course it makes airport security a total breeze. I go back and forth between the rice water protein bars for strengthening my hair and the castor oil bars for nourishing. But I just spotted the tea tree and mint solid shampoo bar, which I am totally getting next. They also have bars for blonde or highlighted hair and dye free and scent free bars as well. Although I will say if you don't mind a scent, the essential oils they use smell fantastic. The shampoo lathers up really nicely and my hair has that squeaky clean feeling when I rinse it out. Now the real test for me was the conditioner bar because with long hair, I have a lot of trouble finding conditioner bars that really work. 
you've got to work the bar into the hair a bit more than if you just took a glob of liquid conditioner and just slapped it on. But as soon as I start working the conditioner through my hair with my fingers, I can definitely feel it working and rinsing it out, I really feel my hair is much softer. The bars also have no sulfates, parabens, or phthalates. But one of the secrets to making your shampoo and conditioner bars go further are in these bar bags. You put the bag around your wrist and then you rub the bar between your hands to get a lather. And then no more messy, sticky soap dishes to worry about. You just hang it anywhere in the shower and it dries. This is super handy for travel because now I don't need to bring hard-sided soap dishes that often take up more luggage space than is actually necessary. Kitsch has an extensive line of hair and beauty products, many of which I'm trying and all of which I'm loving. It's also a women-owned business dedicated to being vegan, cruelty-free with sustainable packaging and use of recycled materials. So it's right up my alley. And today you can get 25% off your first order. They ship to the US and internationally to 27 countries, including Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and more. And they have subscriptions for even better discounts. All you have to do is use the link in the description with this promo code to get started. Mistake number five when packing for a European trip is bringing too much clothing. If you curate your travel wardrobe carefully, you don't need to bring as much stuff as you think. For example, if you make sure that absolutely everything in your travel wardrobe matches, then you have infinitely more wardrobe possibilities than if you brought specific outfits or shoes that don't go with anything else. This is the main idea behind a travel capsule wardrobe, which entails bringing a very small selection of clothing items that all go together and are versatile enough to be appropriate in a variety of different scenarios. I'm currently packing for a three month trip to Europe and I'm doing a really cool experiment with a special kind of travel capsule wardrobe. In a few minutes, I will share exactly what I'm bringing and why. But first, we have a few more things to cover along these lines, such as mistake number six, which is not considering the weather. Europe is bigger than we think it is, and differences in both latitude and altitude can mean some pretty varied weather. For example, if you were high up in the mountains, even if it's summer, it could be much cooler, especially at night. And depending on how high you are, you could even get snow. There are places in Europe where you can ski year round. So it's important to research the specific areas that you're visiting and have a look at the typical weather for that time of year. Bringing layers is the key. Instead of packing one large bulky sweater that you may or may not wear, you could bring a t-shirt, a lighter long sleeve shirt, and a button up shirt like this one. Together, they take up the same space as the sweater and you can wear all of the three of these together to be just as warm. But the advantage is all three of these layers can also be worn individually or in different combinations, giving you way more outfit possibilities in different temperatures. Speaking of layers, don't forget a rain jacket. It's handy not only for the rain, obviously, but you can also use this as a layer for warmth. Mistake number seven is bringing clothing that identifies you as a tourist. There are a few North American fashion sensibilities that will make you stand out like a sore thumb in Europe. For example, overly casually clothing just doesn't fly. People in Europe are generally really well put together everywhere, like even in grocery stores. Athletic wear is only for the gym. Examples of clothes that Europeans don't tend to wear include college sweatshirts or sports team shirts or souvenirs souvenir shirts from other places that you visited. Tevas or similar looking hiking sandals are for athletic pursuits only, and sandals are never, ever, ever, ever to be worn with socks. Flip flops, baseball caps, and convertible pants are also dead giveaways that you're not from around those parts. In another video, I made a snide remark about convertible pants being a fashion faux pas in places like Europe. And I got some flack in the comments from people who didn't see why this would be a problem. Look, I get it. Convertible pants are practical. They're pants and they're shorts. <laughs> You'd think I'd be all for them given their versatility. But unless you are spending 100% of your time hiking in the mountains, convertible pants are not the fashion statement that you wanna make in urban Europe. All of this fashion advice is not about ego. It's about safety. If you look like a tourist, this makes you a target. And if you saw my video about pickpocketing, you'll know that this is a huge issue in many major European cities. Mistake number eight is bringing too many shoes. Now, this is a tough one for me, especially if I'm focused on being that little extra bit fashionable for Europe. On my upcoming trip, I am bringing three pairs of shoes, which some people would argue is one too many, but given how ultralight the third pair is, I figured I would bend my own rules. I'm using the Zero Prio shoe for hiking, working out, and casual walks around town. 
I've been wearing Zero Barefoot shoes for years now, and I have some videos about some of their other shoes that I will leave in the description. The Prio is new to me, and I got it because I have a feeling that this is gonna be the best all-purpose shoe of this type. Stay tuned. But most of the time, I expect to wear my Vivaya Aria 5 shoe. They're super lightweight, they're ridiculously comfy for walking in all day, they're washable, they don't even smell when worn with bare feet, and they are made of recycled plastic bottles. And it's an elevated style that goes with everything. I actually have five pairs of Vivaya shoes, but I chose these ones for this trip because of the neutral color so that they will match up with everything. Last up, I am bringing these Z Trail EV barefoot sandals, also made by Zero Shoes. I'm bringing them because I'm gonna be doing some summer mountain hikes and I wanna see how well they do. And they are super duper ultralight, so they won't take up much luggage space or weight. Along the line of shoes is mistake number nine, which is not breaking in your shoes before you travel. Every time I'm in Europe, I am walking all the time. This is not the time to realize your shoes don't fit properly or you haven't properly broken them in. If you have any doubts about whether or not your shoes are fully broken in, then at least bring along some bandages to cover up the places where the shoes are rubbing against your foot. Okay, before I share my final three tips that could make or break your European trip, I am really excited to share with you this packing experiment that I'm doing for my three month carry on only trip to Europe. Are you ready? I'm bringing a travel capsule wardrobe made of only merino wool clothing. If you're not familiar with merino wool, you might wonder why I would wanna bring a bunch of wool to Europe in the middle of summer. But merino wool is a very special kind of wool that can be made into a variety of different types of clothing depending on the weight of the wool used as well as the combination of materials in the fabric. And contrary to popular opinion, unlike other types of wool, it's not itchy at all. In fact, in many cases, you wouldn't even know it's wool. I will get more into the details of merino wool fabric combinations in another video that I will do towards the end of my trip when I will share with you how this packing experiment ultimately went. But why would I want to travel with merino wool to begin with? Here's a few reasons. One, it's temperature regulating, which means it keeps you cool when it's hot and it keeps you warm when it's cool. Two, it's naturally antimicrobial and antibacterial, which means you won't have to wash it as much and it doesn't smell. Three, it's wrinkle resistant and easy to care for. In most cases, you can machine wash it in cold water and just hang it to dry and it dries quickly. Four, it's environmentally friendly and biodegradable. There's more, but I'll save that for another episode. Let me show you what I'm bringing. I'm bringing three dresses. One is a uh, sleeveless dress here that goes to below the knees. Another is a t-shirt shift dress that can be worn straight or with a belt. And then there's a uh, sleeveless shift dress that is uh, the longest of them all, also can be worn straight or with a belt. I have two bottoms, one of which is a pair of leggings that has a handy little pocket here in the waistband. And the other is a pair of culottes that are a little bit thicker uh, and just a little dressier. For shirts, I have a linen merino, and it is actually still merino, but it, is, it behaves more like linen, tunic, long sleeved, long hair. It can be paired with absolutely all of these outfits for that extra little bit of warmth or elevated style. And I have a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt, and this tank top. These items have been supplied to me by two different companies. One is called Wool and the other one is called Unbound Merino, and I will provide links to all of these items in the description. All of these items together fit into two packing cubes, like really easily. And here are the sorts of outfit possibilities that this small but unique combination of clothes will provide. Please go easy, I'm not a model. <laughs> And now for my final three rapid fire tips that could make or break your next trip to Europe. Number one, bring anti-theft gear and be on the lookout for pickpockets. Europe is candy land for pickpockets, so it's important to know their tricks. Check out my episode about outsmarting pickpockets to get a leg up. 
two, make a photocopy of your passport and write your travel insurance information on the copy. Keep this with you at all times. When I arrive to a destination, I leave my passport in my room, either in the hotel safe or I lock it in my luggage. Three, if you plan on renting a car, check in advance if an international driver's license is required in that country. It is a very easy document to get from AAA or CAA before you leave that translates your driver's license into multiple languages. Some countries legally require it for you to rent a car. If you're planning a trip to Europe, I hope that you are excited about your trip. And now I hope that you're armed with all the information you need to pack smartly and securely for it. If you have any Europe travel hacks to share, please let her rip in the comments. I'm Nora Dunn, AKA the professional hobo, and I'll catch you next time.